you really got to ask yourself, what's your why? What's your passion? What do you want out of your life? See, when you got a bigger why, Jim Rohn, Jim Rohn says it like this. He says, the bigger the why, let me, let me, let me write this down, okay? Uh, hopefully my uh, mouse doesn't freeze again. But uh, Jim Rohn says it like this. He says, the bigger the why, oh, actually, I don't need that. Let me, let me close that out. Uh, I'm going to annotate you with this. Here we go. So Jim Rohn, all right, very successful entrepreneur, very success, uh, life, uh, su su successful what life coach. Oh my gosh, you don't have to know how to speak to make a lot of money either. Um, he says it like this, the bigger the why, okay, the easier the how. See, the how-to okay, which I'm training on today as well, um, is important. And I'm giving you some simple steps and I'll give you more simple steps in order for you to become successful. However, if you don't have a huge, so what's that word? Huge. Why? You will never do the how-to steps, see? And once I realized that, once I really got it, because I can remember going to some of the seminars when I was brand new and learning things. And I would always like look at the speaker and say, all right, cut to the chase on some of this, you know, inspirational stuff or some of this mindset stuff. Like I already believe in myself. Like, let's go like get, get to the point of where you're going to teach me how to talk to people more, get to the point of where you're going to show me how to sell more products, like the tangible, like how to's of the business. Right. And the reality is, is the reason why attitude, knowledge, and goals and having a why are, are number one and number two of the basic five is because if you don't have the first two down to the heart, that you'll never do the how-to. You won't be confident enough in yourself to do the how-tos. You need to be confident enough that the people you're approaching with the opportunity to change their life forever, they believe that you believe you're going to change your life. Because if they don't believe in you, and they're not buying you yet, you're going to get people saying, let me know when you make some money. And the reason they're saying that to you is because they don't believe in you at this point, or they don't believe in themselves at this point. It may not be all you. It could be their past programming. So don't take all the blame on that, but look in the mirror on that and saying, am I being the person that I would follow? Do I have the confidence do like when I seen JR on stage, you guys, when I seen, I mean, let's face it. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second and just talk to you guys. So when I went to my first event, okay, here's, so here's the deal. I went to my first event, uh, my first big event. Um, I was new in the business. I bought, I invested in 10 tickets to my, the first local su seminar, which we had to drive an hour and 45 minutes to. There was no seminars in, in Kankakee, Illinois. And if you don't know where Kankakee is, just, Google David Letterman show because he sent his gazebos one year as the worst place to live in America as a gift. And then our, 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 our town, you know, proudly posted the gazebos on the, on the grass of the, of the courthouse as yes, you know, like, are you kidding me? Anyways, the whole point is, is that uh, in Kankakee, like we had to go an hour and 45 minutes to the seminar. Okay. But we did it. And out of those 10 tickets I invested in, they didn't cost me anything. It was an investment, an investment into what? Myself. I believe in myself. I am going to sell these tickets. And many of you sold tickets into today. And congratulations. And I'm going to talk more about how to do that. But you can't sell a ticket that you don't believe in. But see, if I've got a ticket to belief, a ticket for hope, a ticket for someone's future, all of that is what I'm selling people on is I have a way to help people and what's your better idea? And of course, they don't have that better idea. So see, that's why it's easy for me to sell that ticket. Because I know if anything else, by them coming to one of our seminars, are they going to become a better person? Are they going to become more valuable in the marketplace? Are they going to learn some mindset stuff that is non-refutable? You can't debate. I don't care. This is science, mental mindset stuff of saying, listen, if you don't want to cheer people on to be better in their life, then I guess it is what it is. But we are not going to buy into doom and gloom. We're going to buy into cheering each other on to become more positive, more marketable in the marketplace. So I show up to that seminar. I got six people with me at that seminar. I hit the challenge. I didn't even know what the challenge was. I was just doing what they told me to do because I 
figured if they knew what to do, I should just do what they told me to do. And I trusted them fast. People want to go fast, trust fast. If you want to go slow, trust slowly. But the number one thing you're trusting in is you're trusting in the company, you're trusting in the person who you're working with and the team you're working with. And thirdly, most importantly, we have to trust ourselves. Those are the three trust factors. Usually people are going slow because they have a hang up in one of those areas and they're still building their trust. If you're a guest on the line with us today, you're still building your trust in us as a company, in our products, in the person you're working with, and that's okay. Why do you think we say you need to look at it three times? Why do we want to get you to a training first in many cases? Like get to the training. We don't have nothing to hide. There's no bait and switch with our company. We don't do anything unethical. I know 100% that you would show up to an event and be stoked by the end of that training and want to partner with us. See, so we have nothing to hide. And if somebody doesn't want to be part of an environment where again, we're going to high five and cheer people on, this probably ain't going to work for them. It's like, you guys are way too happy. And I go, I know, it's the weirdest thing. You guys have way too much fun. Scam. Is this one of those businesses where you guys have fun? Uh, yeah, scam. Is this one of those businesses where you guys like try to make money off of people? Must be a scam. Is this one of those businesses where, where, where you guys help people with nutritional products and they call you up with like outrageous, amazing testimonials? Yeah, we do that. Scam. Like, are you one of these businesses where you empower people to become better and, 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 and bigger in their life than they ever thought they could be? Yeah, we do that too. Scam. Like, are you serious? When you listen, when you truly listen to what some people say, it is fascinating. Jackie Blasco, it is fascinating that this is what people believe. This is what they think. It, that's the scam. The scam is that you believe all that crap, that you believe all of that stuff is bad. That's the scam of life. If you believe that crap, give me a break. Like that we empower people, that, that that's bad. Are you serious? Think about what we're saying to ourselves and what other people have said to us and we bought and we believed. So I brought six people with me to that seminar. Then I showed up in Miami two months later to our MA World, uh, World Conference and I had the six people with me and we all show up and, and, and back then, you know, there was no assigned seating. So it's like just the front two rows were reserved and it was kind of roped off. And then like, but we ran to our seats. We had to like, and like, as we're running to our seats, people are wiping out in front of me and I'm like jumping over them and, and I'm looking back going, are you okay? I'm like, I gotta go. I gotta get to my seat. And my whole team is running with me. And we ran down to the floor and we're like in the second or third row because I just wanted to be like in the splash zone like the spit zone from the stage. And, and I just wanted JR to be like, you know, like some of that sweat, like, like pouring off of, I mean, when JR speaks, he sweats a lot. So he's like sweat everywhere. And it's like just shooting out into the audience. And I'm just going, rub off on me. And people think, that's crazy, Colin. And I go, but here's what I bought. It wasn't everything they said from stage, but it was who they were being. I bought the fact that I love the fact that JR is all in. He's sweating like a pig up there and threw his underwear, like he's sweating. And it's like, and, he, and he's so passionate. I bought that. JR is, we got this and I believe in you. And then you got Dennis Franks. He came on stage and Dennis Franks comes out and you're Dennis Franks, you know? And I, and I knew he used to play in the NFL for the Philadelphia Eagles, right? And, and, and so he comes walking out and he's dancing. He's like, yeah, let's go, let's go. And you guys over there and woo, you know? And, and so, you know, we nickname him Mr. Energy, right? And so he's just dancing, he's having fun. He's like, all right, all right, here we go, you know? And I'm like, wow, he's cool. I, I, I a different energy than JR. JR is more introverted. Believe it or not, he's an introvert. JR is total introvert, the guy who started this. And then you got Dennis, who's total extrovert, right? And he's, woo, he's dancing. Then you got Kevin Buckman. And Kevin Buckman, he walks out on stage and it's like this. Everybody's cheering super loud and Kevin's like. Like Kevin's like all business, like, like stop joking around. All right. And let's freaking make some money with this thing. Let's go, let's go change some lives. And, but see, he was a high level VP for a nuclear facility when he got introduced to this company. Kevin's very business oriented, right? And then you've got Elizabeth Weber and Elizabeth Weber's like, woo. And she's like, yeah. And she's fired up and she's excited and she's got all this energy. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, she is on fire up there. She is so excited, so passionate, so, so, so much energy. You know, you guys, you guys are going to believe it. It's only a matter of time. 
I failed at nine MLMs. Nine MLMs I tried, and I never made enough money to leave my job. And then I get introduced to this binomial thing, the binomial compensation where we can get more people paid, the vertical compensation. Oh, are you kidding me? She was out of her job. She was like, let's go. And in six months, she was making six figures. And people go, oh, six months, six figures. I'm like, if that's all you heard, you missed the message. She had been in business for over 11 years to get better as a person. Even though those companies didn't necessarily work for her, financially speaking, and she still was her, you know, had her job as a legal secretary for the city of Boston. In that process, what happened? She became better. She learned what worked, what didn't work. She became better at her communication skills. She had to learn some things. So 11 years and six months with the right company, six months with the right compensation plan, six figures. But those of you that want to do it in six months, but you haven't been through what she's been through in 11 years, and Cullen hadn't been through that either, I got to set some realistic expectations on myself here. See, everybody's got different personalities, you know? And then you've got Steve Harris. Steve Harris uh, used to own an exotic car dealership, like Lamborghinis, Ferraris, all that. So, so Steve Harris walks in and he's same thing. He's got like his briefcase and he's just like, he's carrying the briefcase and he's like, Hi, Colin, how you doing? You know, he's saying, you know, and I'm, I'm going, oh my gosh, he looks so professional. I'm looking straight. I'm like, should I get a briefcase? I don't know. Do I need a briefcase to be successful? Maybe I should buy a briefcase. I don't know. I don't know if I need a briefcase, but Steve Harris, he looks very professional. Maybe I should get a briefcase. I don't, these were, but there was so, here's my point. I can do one on everybody, you guys. The bottom line is there are so many random personality types that are making money with the unfranchised that the only common thread that I could draw the conclusion on as to why they're successful is they have a big reason why. Because it doesn't matter if you're introvert, extrovert. Doesn't matter if you're new in business or you've been in business for 50 years. Everyone has to learn new skills in order to become successful, put their pride and ego at the door, check the pride and ego at the door. There always is gonna be something you need to learn to be better because building a residual income is way different than building a job income, it is. And that takes some time for this thing to ramp up in the beginning, but it doesn't mean that you don't make any money right out of the gate with retail profit and building a successful business. So why, why are you here today? Why are you uh, evaluating the unfranchised? What is it that you're looking for that you don't currently have that you would like to have? This is what we're trying to figure out as we drill down. So the first thing I want everybody to do is take out a piece of paper. You're gonna take out a piece of paper. If you don't have a piece of paper, ask your neighbor a piece of paper. And if you're home and you're not with a group of people, then ask, ask your, ask your child if you can borrow one of their pieces of paper uh, or ask the dog or the cat if they've got a piece of paper somewhere, but you're going to need a piece of paper. That's what, that's what I know at this point. So uh, after you grab that piece of paper, first rung of building out your why, you're going to draw a big circle on the outside, as big as you can make that circle. I mean, don't be huge, as huge as the paper, but pretty big on the paper. What's my why? You're going to draw a circle. My why. So if I reflect back, I'm going to do this with you guys. So what's my why? Well, my why is, you know, I want to spend uh, more time with my kids. Why am I doing this business? I want to spend more time with my kids. So you're going to jot down what your why is right now. Why are you doing this business? Why would you consider doing this business? I wanted more time with my kids. As much as I liked my job, I love my family more. And my job was never going to cut my hours back to 10 hours a week and allow me to be at my kids' games. And so therefore, I want to spend more time with my kids. So I, in order to do that, I need to do something different than my job. That's what I knew. So once you got that, what's your why? What do you want? Then we're going to drill down one rung deeper. Draw another circle on the inside of that. Now, all my perfectionists that are watching this, you don't have to try to write around the circle if that drives you crazy. Just write it out to the side and draw an arrow to the circle that we're talking about. And so you're going to ask yourself, why is that so important? So I want to spend more time with my kids. And then you say, okay, Colin, why is it so important for you to spend more time with your kids? I say, well, because it would be exciting for me to spend a lot more time with my kids and be at all their school functions. So I boil it down to what specifically about spending time with my kids would excite me. 
And, and so I drilled it deeper, which means I, I want to be at all their games. I want to see their face. I want to see their, you know, when they make the shot, when they played the instrument, when they, you know, it was Valentine's and there was only two, two room moms or room dads showing up to the party. I wanted to be the third. I was going to be there. I was going to make it happen. I wanted to see the look on my kid's face to know that Trinity and I are there all the time. Quite frankly, we wanted our kids to beg for a sitter uh, because we're there all the time. And, and the kids would, they would be like, don't you got to go anywhere? My friend's parents are gone all the time. And like, don't you have to go be somewhere? And it's like, no, we're here. What are we doing today? Like what's on the agenda? And so that was also fun. So I'm going to hit the right button. See, if we were doing this live, that would have provoked a re uh, an applause. So let's hit the applause button to make sure that that kind of got the energy where it would have been if we were all live. See, Anyway, so, uh, so let's drill it down one more, okay? So I go one, one layer deeper. So draw another circle inside. Why do you want to see the look on your kid's face? Why is it so important for you to be at your kid's functions? And, and I had to really internalize this. Uh, but the more I thought about it is because, again, I, I grew up with parents who missed 90% of my events. So they were missing 90%. They were there 10%. And I can remember the feeling of looking in the stands or being in the classroom and looking at the door and thinking, you know, is one of my parents going to come when other parents were coming? And I remember that feeling and I didn't want my kids to have to experience that. So this is me drilling down. Now you're not mine. If yours matches mine, that's fine. Okay. But, but if, if it's not about the kids, you know, look, some people want to get home with the kids. Other people want to get away from the kids. So it just depends. Everybody's different. My why don't have to be your why is what I'm getting at. Okay. So as we drill down, each time you're, you're digging, digging deeper and deeper. So now we go to the next layer. Colin, how do you know for sure that you spending more time at your kids' events is what it is? Well, I, I knew, I know because my parents missed most of mine. Okay, I get that. But the next layer is, how did it make you feel when your parents missed stuff? And quite frankly, it was devastating. I remember, like it was yesterday, where my dad would say, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, a weekend game was the potential. So weekdays were out because he was always dark to dark, and, uh, or he would be picking me up at the end of the game. And I can remember my dad uh, picking me up at the end of one of my Little League games, uh, baseball, and uh, we were in the car and he said, how did it go? And I said, well, we won. And he's like, oh, that's, that's good. And I said, yeah. And he said, so how did you do? And I said, well, I hit a home run. And he said, he said, uh, well, that's, that's great. How, how did it feel when you hit the home run? And I said, I don't know, dad. I mean, maybe if you were there, you would have been able to feel it with me. As a kid, you're not thinking about how anybody else feels. You're just thinking about how you feel. I wasn't thinking, my dad got upset after I said that, and the rest of the car ride home wasn't very exciting. Um, and it got very quiet because I really hurt my dad's feelings, something terrible. But see, I couldn't look at things from my dad's perspective. All I could see was my perspective because I'm a kid and I'm not, I was never taught how to look at things from different perspectives at that age. And so therefore it's my story. It's my life. This is what happened. I'm right. My dad's wrong. And I'm going to share with you how I felt and how I felt was uh, if you would have been there that, you know, he would know, you know, but that was devastating for my dad. It was devastating for me to not have my dad there but I didn't make the situation any better. As I got older, I realized that, and jot, if you're taking notes, jot this down. Everyone, everyone, which includes you, which includes me, which includes my dad, everyone is doing the best job they can at the time. At the time, based on their past programming, based on who they are as a person, based on what, what they think they should be doing. 
see, my dad thought he should be doing what he's doing to work that job and take care of the family. And, and, and so that's all my dad knew. And that's what he was doing. There was no other option as far as my dad was concerned. There was no two to three year plan being offered to my dad. Or my dad didn't believe enough in himself. Because as we get to the last layer of this, there's one more I'll circle in the, in the middle here. You're really dialing it on the bullseye. As I thought more about the situation and I reflected back to you know, that age and, and situations where my parents weren't there and I was a kid riding my bike to and from my games and all this stuff, um, there was another specific incident. So you might ask yourself, what, what specific incidents happened to me uh, growing up to where I can reflect on something to know that I, that's what I want to change for my future, whatever it might be. Um, and I can remember a Pony League game. So I was probably like 13 or 14. My dad said he was going to come. And I remember getting up to bat, looking in the stands and my dad wasn't there. And, and I remember my best friend uh, at the time, one of my best friends, I should say, uh, Jason Hauser was pitching for the other team. And, uh, he threw a curveball and he hung it right down the middle and, and I, hit, I hit it over the center field fence. I hit home run and I'm rounding the bases. I come and I touch home. The whole team is there to congratulate me. High five me. Tell me how amazing that was. Which by the way, that's what it's about. I mean, when I say you jump on Facebook and cheer each other on, this is a human need. This is a, I mean, whether you, whether you want the need or not, it's not about you. This is about the team. That team and that moment, it's a magic moment. See, and business is the same way, by the way. So it doesn't matter if we're talking musical instruments, singing, doesn't matter if you're an actor, an actress in a play, doesn't matter what is singing at your church. It doesn't matter if you're building a business. It's a team. And like we could pull together as a team and we're better as a team. So they're all cheering me on and excited. Can you imagine going to a Green Bay Packer game and Aaron Rodgers drops back to make a pass. And as he drops back and he's looking and then he, and then he throws it. And as he throws the pass, the whole crowd stands up. All of you at home stand up watching it on your TV screens and everybody, the energy raises in the room. And it's like, oh my gosh, yes. And, and then the, and the receiver lays out and, and they catch the ball in the end zone and they score they scored the touchdown. And many times this was against my freaking Chicago Bears. So I know how painful it is from the other side of the coin. But, but for all of you Packer fans that this happens and then all of you at home, this is what happens. Everybody at home and everybody in the stadium, this is what it looks like. Everybody goes. That is not what happens. It is chaos. Everybody's high-fiving. Everybody's chest bumping each other. There's freaking spit flying. you got friends all around you that you didn't even know before the game started. It is chaos. You're at home. Everybody's clacking your beers and because beers and your cheese curds. Cheese curds are, I, I learned about cheese curds when I did a seminar in your area many years ago. And those things, those things should be illegal because I think just looking at them, I gain weight. But, but cheese curds and beer, and everybody's like, like high-fiving, and it's chaos. Because in that moment of time, nothing else mattered. Nothing else matters because we scored the touchdown. We won the game. We do the Lambo leap into the stands. Everybody's going absolutely bonkers. And for a moment in time, we created an environment where we didn't have to worry about any crap. We could all just have some fun and relax and have a great time. And, but we had to co-create this environment together, you guys. And that's what the GMTSS does. That's what our system does, okay? There's nothing weird about it at all, all right? Matter of fact, I'm quite frankly, the one who sits back down and goes, that's weird. All right. Like get excited. It's okay. And I get everybody's level of excitement is going to be different based on the personality type of the person. And that's okay. But raise the bar. Maybe your, your, your level of excitement is a four and that's your hundred percent effort. Then maybe go to a five. I'm not saying you have to be a Cullen Haskins 10. Okay. Or, or a Shelly Bow. I mean, Shelly Bow. Oh my God. Shelly Bow is like, you know, Shelly Bow's 10 for a lot of people. Scary, right? Like, oh my gosh, Shelly Bow is, she's intense, right? But, but it's, it's okay. Cause that's, guess what? 
that's Shelly. And you get to be you too. But raise the bar just a little bit, folks. Just a little bit, right? I round the bases, I hit home. Everybody's high five and their chest bump and everything's exciting. We go back to the dugout. My buddy Jay, Jay Swaim in the dugout, uh, he says to me, he says, he says, Haskins, he said, look out in center field. And I look out in center field. And you know, at most baseball games growing up, everybody sits behind, you know, the, the first base and third baseline, you know, cause it's not like we've got thousands of fans, but everybody sits in this bleachers, you know, behind home plate or, you know, but there's one person in center field holding the baseball. It was my dad. I still remember like it was yesterday because he was there. And now my dad got to feel what it feel like for me to hit a home run and hear the roar of the crowd and my teammates high-fiving me. And I just wanted my dad to be proud of me. And so it was a magic moment, magic moment in my life. And when I got to the core of my onion and as it started to uncontrollably make me ball, uh, <laughs> I'll call it the core, building back to the core of the onion. You know, you peel an onion back and as you peel an onion back, by the time you get to the core of it, you're probably shedding a tear or two. And if you're not shedding a tear or two, I would challenge you to say, are you at the core of the onion? Now you don't need to be a blubbering mess like I am right now, but, but you should at least know something is striking a chord in your heart because it has to go from your head to your heart, folks. That's what we just did in this process. And if you've got it, if you've got it, that, then you're going to know because it's heart centered. Everything we do with Market America as a company, the company's job is to provide the products and the tools and the systems like a franchise for us to be successful. But for us to become successful, we have to go do our part. And asking my cousin who owns a bunch of CC's pizza franchises, you know, cousin Steve, what's the number one reason why a franchise fails, a CC's pizza would fail? And he said, the owner invests a large sum of money into the franchise, but they put the money in, but they don't show up. They think it's going to run itself. That CC's Pizza franchise, that location will fail nine times out of 10. He said, then with the franchise owners will offer that franchise to someone like my cousin, Steve, who's going to do it the right way. Because they know the location's going to work. They won't let you open the, the franchise in a place that the population location doesn't dictate the franchise is going to succeed. A lot of planning goes into locations. Same thing with the unfranchise. See, we can have the incredible products, incredible system. We can have incredible team. JR, our executive say, uh, management team that's been together from inception. Everybody's amazing, you guys. But at the end of the day, they can't come do the work for you. We got to be willing to do the work as individuals on us, us every day from here to here to our heart. And then, and then with the team is where the magic happens. Okay. For all of us to link arms and do it together. Okay. Freedom to me is to have the time to be able to put time on the most important things in life, but financial, uh, your financial stability dictates what freedom you're going to have time on. I met Ernie when we were 15 years old. I really liked him. I liked him a lot because we're both athletes and uh, he was very shy. Still am. Still am, right. Probably by the end of that first year, by the time we were 16, we were pretty sure that, that we were going to get married and stay together. And of course our goal was to become teachers and of course I always wanted to be a coach. That was a lifetime dream. And uh, of course she was very uh, athletic as well, so she, she was also a coach. Life goes by quickly. You know, you're, you're married and then you have kids and then the years go by and then you find yourself, I mean, you're struggling trying to earn a living. As, as we got older, we knew things had to change. We knew things had to change. We had to find something and that's when we began to look. We were about 54 years old and we had a financial planner come out and kind of sit down with us. 
we thought, you know, we'll be okay at retirement. We have capers and we have some annuities. So she sat down with us and said, you're not going to live as well as you are right now. And for Ernie and I, that was devastating because we were living from paycheck to paycheck and sometimes not making it, just barely, barely making, uh, making a living. You know, when you, when you love what you do and you're very successful at it, and so we, we were actually fulfilling our dreams. We just didn't know. April cops already. Um, and I come from a hardworking family. So we didn't know that there was a better way. We thought everyone did the same thing. I believe that's right. If we would have had Market America or, or the men in front of us then, we definitely would have taken a look at it because we were wanting uh, more time with the family, wanting Ernie to spend more time with the family, but didn't see any alternative. for the rest of my life I'm going to appreciate David because he was he came to me and he said you know I've come across a business opportunity Jeanette I know that it's going to be phenomenal it'll give Ernie's always wanted to boat you guys have always wanted more time you've talked about this all your life being able to travel this is going to be able to do it for you I want to sit down and show you what we have I said all right David I'll look at it and, and that says a lot about a son-in-law when we first started, I, I was looking for $300 extra dollars a month because I said to Ernie, if we can find $300, we can put it into annuities, add to what we're doing already, and the more we can add, you know, we don't have very many years, but at least we'll help at retirement. And from August to December, we made our first $1,500. Within that first year, uh, nine months, we made $1,500. And so when we came back for the inter international convention, we put down some goals. Finishing this uh, challenge, Ernie. We put an action plan to it, and we went to work. And the next year, then, we, we made $80,000. And then it, it just kept duplicating. The next year, we made $179,000. And the next year, $280,000. Until now, we're making about $300,000 about $300, a year. So this, when this came along, we said, wow. It was almost too good to be true, uh, but at the same time, uh, we saw no risk, and this looked like something that we need to at least try to see if it worked for us. And that was the best uh, decision we made. It changed our life completely. It's just given us time, freedom to spend with our families. Uh, about four years ago, my father was really sick with cancer. We only had a certain amount of time to live. So we were able to spend all that time with Dad. And, and, and you can't ever buy that time back. We wouldn't have been able to do that had we not found Market America. Um, I, I, I love spending time with the family, but we also get a lot of time to spend time with each other and do what we want to do. Uh, we're, every three months, our goal is to take a trip somewhere. So in October, we're going to Europe. And, uh, of course, we just come back from the Eastern Caribbean with the whole family, uh, 14 of us, all of our kids, grandkids, or spouses, and we were able to pay for that. We would never have been able to do that before Market America. It wouldn't have even, it wouldn't even have been a possibility. It's given us back our youth. It's given us back our commitment to each other. Uh, you know, people go a lifetime, retire maybe two or three years together, and they're gone. For Ernie and I, it's, it's not that way. This was my best friend. And uh, also my lover, my wife, so uh, the mother of my children. So let's give us back our life.